Hi, I'm Paco Nathan from O'Reilly Media, and we're here at JupyterCon. And I'm grateful to get to talk with Rachel Thomas from Fast AI, uh, founding researcher at, at Fast AI. Yes. And uh, excellent keynote this morning. Uh, Thank you. It really, really struck me just the, 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 the breadth of different applications. Um, even, I mean, like looking at the range of what your students have been doing, uh, of course we can talk about the industry in general, but uh, I wanted to try to talk more about that. Like what, what are you seeing in terms of range for, for deep learning? Sure. Um, so yeah, covered in my keynote this range from, you know, people working on the Urdu language in Pakistan yeah. to a student in India who's helping create better crop insurance for farmers there. Um, but that was, I mean, this was kind of our goal with Fast AI. It was to get deep learning into the hands of kind of as many pe um, people as possible. Um, and with the idea that, you know, people in different places from different backgrounds and with different domain expertise are going to have problems that they're knowledgeable and passionate about and want to solve. What kind of prerequisites coming into the program? Uh, so the, yeah, so the only prerequisite for the course is one year of coding experience oh, right okay. now. Um, so yeah, no advanced math prerequisites. Interesting. So, yeah. uh, so, so you can come in with maybe like a year of working in Python or or any, any particular... Yeah, so we have this teaching philosophy with the um, kind of ideas. So it's inspired by David Perkins, a professor at Harvard of, um, he calls it the whole game. Okay. But with kids, like you don't require a child to remember all, um, all the formal rules of baseball before they're allowed to play. Right. They can just get out there and have fun and have a general sense of what baseball is like. Um, and they might not be playing a full nine innings or have a full team. And as they get older, they learn more formal roles. Um, and so we wanted to do that with deep learning of kind of get people right away using it, getting a sense of what it can do. Um, and then over time, digging more into the details of how it works. And, our and in our course, it's always kind of motivated by wanting to improve the model's performance or tackle right. a more challenging problem. Uh, one of the things at O'Reilly that I've heard from the editors, like going way back, was just page one, paragraph one of the first chapter, jump into some code, get going, yeah. get people comfortable and, and confident. It sounds like you're taking, a, you have a, a very similar kind of approach there. Yes, yeah, so kind of get people coding right away with working models. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, interesting, so what kind of conceptual uh, hurdles do people have when they're first starting to work out with deep learning? Um, that's a good question. Yes, I mean, there are definitely several things that I think are, are conceptually weird. We also, we do things, um, and this is kind of Jeremy's inspiration, like we'll, um, we've implement, like we'll use Excel to illustrate things, because oh, Excel excellent. can be this yeah. like really neat visual tool. Yeah. And so we have like um, stochastic gradient descent, and also all these like fancy optimizers yeah. implemented in Excel, because you can, you know, like just really see like, okay, these are the cells that are like updating, and right. we actually have a convolution implemented of like, this uh -huh. is how, like what a convolution's doing. So that's a tool we'll kind of use to try to, um, so you, yeah, I, if somebody's like stumped on a concept of kind yeah. of like, okay, like let's think about what it just like looks like in terms of like cells updating, and then we'll like go back to the Python. Oh, that's excellent, because yeah. it, uh, some of these algorithms, you try to read the pseudocode in the paper, and that's maybe like yeah. the first... Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> implementing algorithms from papers can be painful, and we, we, we do some of that in uh, part two of the course, yeah. Uh, excellent. So people are getting hands-on then as, as far as implementation. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and like part two, the goal is um, it's about being able to read research papers and implement them. Oh, that would have been so helpful. Yeah. In fact, Although... I think I probably <laughs> need that now. So yeah, I'll, we are, we are advising people to, unless unless they're very interested in that part, to, to skim over the math. Because um, it's a, kind of the set of goals for, you know, a lot of uh, deep learning researchers are coming out of this very academic community and, you know, are focused on this publishing papers and kind of right. what the incentives are around, like, what's interesting to publish and what's going to get you into a top journal, right. which is very different from the concerns of a practitioner that's like, how do I solve this, you know, tangible problem for my particular data set? What, one thing that, I mean, when I first started hearing about deep learning, uh, I was thinking that, okay, this will hop out in some areas of, say, smartphones, making smartphones smarter. Um, but it didn't really strike me like where the impact would be just uh, in, in, in terms of everyday needs. Yeah. Um, I think that talking with Jeremy at Analytic was probably one of the first eye-openers for me of just how much this can be applied in medicine, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of areas of healthcare that have been very, very difficult before. You, you were talking about Oh, something. yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I actually just wrote a blog post this week about this, but yeah, listing kind of all these different areas of medicine where deep learning is being applied. I mean, this is everything from dermatology to ophthalmology and yeah. um, 
cardiac health and pediatric ICU mortality, um, lots of areas. And I think there's, and I still feel like we're just at the tip of the iceberg um, because a lot, you know, a lot is still using image data, um, but there's so much with uh, medical records and other data sources to be incorporated. So, so are we looking at deep learning as a kind of processing of image data, or are we looking at deep learning as a way to integrate a lot of different data sources? Like, are um, I would say a way in? to integrate a lot of different data sources, yeah. And I think um, right now there are use cases that are just kind of processing right. um, the data, but you can enter data of you know different forms and have, and we cover this in um, part two of the course, where you can put in an image and then also put in you know some metadata about that image and have these different types of inputs all going into to a neural network to awesome. um, yeah, help you make a prediction. Oh, excellent. Um, changing gears a little bit, uh, you had an article months ago about uh, diversity in tech, but also diversity in AI. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk more about that. There was an excellent um, article on Medium, I remember, that you, that you had recently about the diversity okay, problem. Yeah, right? yeah. So I mean, I think that, so I mean, tech's diversity problems are getting a lot of attention in general, Absolutely. and I think that AI is even less diverse than much of the rest of tech. And this is particularly scary to me because we're building such high impact technologies right now. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know we're already seeing examples of you know unintentional bias in our algorithms, um, and some you know high-profile examples have been you know Google Photos labeling black people as gorillas in 2015, or Google Translate still um, yeah. will go from languages that have a gender-neutral singular pronoun, it'll translate a sentence into he is a doctor, she is a nurse, yeah. even when the gender wasn't specified, um, and so I think. There's just kind of the, the potential for more and more of that as AI becomes more pervasive. And one, uh, one thing that needs to be done is we need more diverse teams building the technology. Uh, I, there was one example uh, you're referencing, I think it was ProPublica, but about you know sentencing guidelines and, and yes, and, yeah, and that's <laughs> yeah, this, that's really sad. Um, so this is ProPublica did an investigation on recidivism, this recidivism algorithm that was used. I don't know if it still is used in yeah. uh, U.S. courtrooms, and it was found to be biased against um, black people and biased in favor of white people. Um, yeah, re and this was used in determining people's yeah, like whether they got parole. Um, really concerning. Kathy O'Neill has an excellent book, right. Weapons of Math Destruction, and covers right. a lot of these. And you know, these aren't necessarily um, machine learning. I think in some cases because they're even simpler algorithms. But that algorithms are being used more and more for hiring decisions, firing decisions. Right. Yeah, these ones related to people's prison sentences. Um, and so, a lot of area cons of concern. Uh, with bias being in those, and then also with them, they often are not auditable. And in the U.S., we're kind of getting this weird interface of you know private companies produce right. them, and yeah. then they're not subject to the same like state public record laws that um, we usually have into our public institutions, and so that's scary as well. Yeah, like, that, like, was, that was frightening about, about yeah, that. Yeah, like, like the other one that really scares me is Taser um, acquired two AI companies earlier this year. And they've been marketing that they're developing predictive policing software because they own 80% of the police body cam market in the U.S. <laughs> um, and so there's, <laughs> there's so much that can go wrong there, I think. Well, what's your perspectives then in terms of, of the balance of this? On, on the one hand, we're seeing deep learning and other areas of AI being uh, just, just augmenting so much of what we can do. Yes. On the other hand, we're seeing federal judiciary, which should be people who are really interested in looking at evidence and making a judgment, yeah. basically pushing a button. So what, what's your guidance for being able to strike that balance between the automation and the insight? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's really important. I mean, it's also it's important to keep both the like, you know, like all this potential upside of like, we can save millions of lives and like keep that in mind at the same time as these potential risks of like, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, people can be unjustly sentenced. Um, so I think that it's becoming more and more important that I think everyone needs to have some working knowledge of just like how do you evaluate algorithms and think about bias because um, this is something that I think lawyers and doctors and you know all different fields are going to need to have some level of literacy around um, even if they're not coding um, themselves but yeah I think that the you know, I think there's potential that algorithms could be less biased. Like we know that human right. judges make really biased decisions sure. in our criminal justice system as well, like sure. in biased hiring and firing decisions. And so I feel like there is some potential of like, well, an algorithm could 
you know, be less biased, um, but we really need to be able to like audit these systems and be aware also of just, yeah, the potential risks so that we can be looking out for them. Yeah, that, that's a really good analogy. They're, they're in the judiciary, we know that there's, there's always going to be bias. So yeah. there, there are audits. There's definitely a, a paper trail. Yes, um, yeah. Say. But there's also appeals right. and, and overturns. And yes, like yeah, and I think those are important components for, yeah, for this. And, and these are also like important questions that we should be asking whenever right. we hear yeah. about these algorithms of, yeah, like what is the appeals process right. of like how are mistakes like found and corrected? And also just really thinking about like, you know, what was the training set and is that representative of um, kind of the variety in the world? I mean, I, I think maybe the tip of the iceberg would have been the scorecards used for credit ratings. I mean, this is going back a couple oh, of decades, yeah. but it's sort of like there were machine learning algorithms being used to decide whether or not you could buy a new car. And now it's, it's, it's really snowballing because there's a lot more machine learning yes, and a lot more yeah. decisions like that. Yeah. Did you read, the, this was uh, in Wired this week, there was like an article how um, researchers found that, um, so they were like training training a machine learning algorithm and they had pictures of, you know, like women were in kitchens more often and men were at computers more often, but the machine learning algorithm didn't just learn that bias, it amplified it. Like it was disproportionately, oh. like when it saw a man in the kitchen saying like, oh, that must be a woman <laughs> because it's a person in the kitchen um, at like a rate that wasn't even, that was like magnified from the um, imbalance in the, that- the training set, which is, that, that's something, actually, yeah. I, I need a little bit of guidance. Um, one of the things we're, we're using deep learning for in media is to try to disambiguate contexts. And so this has been something that we kind of inherited from big data. There's a mm-hmm. lot of great ways to understand correlations uh, and look for things that are generalized as patterns. Yeah. But when you have to try to separate things out, I don't know that the tooling's really there yet. Yeah. So, I mean, there are things you can do in terms of, like, you can always kind of ver- like change your inputs, like, you know, change a particular variable to try to see how does that have an impact on your output. Yeah. Um, and so even, because deep learning is often described as a black box, but it's like there are ways to, yeah, to introspect what's going on. Um, but that's also like an area that should be focused on more, of, you know, like looking at, like, how do you look at variable importance and kind of find these things. You're showing heat maps to be able to find yes, out yeah. really what are the features that are being picked on, yeah. or picked up for a particular decision. Um, sounds a bit like kind of a ridge regression approach, like change, throw a little noise in the input and see what shakes up in oh, terms of decisions. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, or like with random forest, you know, you can do this kind of like uh, variable importance where you just yeah, like, you yeah, know, are like scores. randomly shuffling, yeah, uh, like a particular variable. Interesting. Um, well, also to change gears a little bit, uh, just general advice, uh, a big theme in JupyterCon here is about use of Jupyter in education. Mm-hmm. And you've, you've had fantastic uh, results out of your program. Uh, what kind of advice would you have for, for teachers, for educators, who are just probably even now trying to grapple with how are they going to present artificial intelligence as a separate? Yeah, no, so I definitely recommend Jupyter. Um, it's just, uh, and so we, we've now created three courses entirely in Jupyter Notebooks that also are available online. Um, but it's just really great to be able to have the text and the code interspersed. Um, yeah. And I'm even finding, like, I'm looking back on stuff I did kind of, like, longer ago, a few years ago, that, like, it makes it easier to kind of break things into these smaller pieces, you know, and it's still continuous, but to really kind of have your text and diagrams interspersed first with the, like right. kind of these like digestible blocks of code that um, people can understand it just it really takes like commenting it to the next level right, to, right. yeah well, well, like kind the, of like have an explanation and a picture alongside yeah the, sort of the the literate programming I think was probably a, an idea this is going back to like the 80s oh, okay. or sort of it. the idea of having code that conveyed to people and oh yes you know, the, yeah the computation part was sort of a byproduct yeah um, yeah no and I totally yeah like I feel like that's kind of like the idea with Jupiter of like you're, you're like creating a narrative for a person. And, and it, it's almost like there's, there's kind of a, a cadence or a rhythm when you're chunking your code into blocks yes. that are easily understood. Yeah. Or, or the text that you're writing too. Is, is, do you feel that there's kind of like a, a, a cadence that you get into when you're writing this? Yes, yeah, and I can definitely like also tell when things are off of like, okay, I huh. need to like refactor that or like split that into two functions or something. If it's, yeah, like I think this is gonna be like harder to, to explain or teach. Interesting, very good. Alrighty, thank you, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Thank you. (laughs)